I'm JJ Perez with Inside Runner Sports. Greg Luca, San Antonio Express News. We're coming to you from Frisco, Texas. From a chilly press box in Frisco, Texas. Toyota Stadium, home of the Frisco Bowl 2021. UTSA drops a tough battle, Greg, to San San Diego State 38-24. Um, what were your biggest takeaways from today's game? Wow, what a tough question. Yeah. I had a hard time trying to figure out what direction I wanted to take the story, so I just went really broad of just like you know this is going to be something that emotionally is tough on them in the immediate aftermath but right. it doesn't really diminish what they accomplished this season and Frank Gabe gave us a, a great line on that basically said we're still champions even though today yep. wasn't you know however he phrased it but it was I think that's kind of the big takeaway and that's pretty you know obvious and cliche in a lot of ways but I just think you know what happened here doesn't overshadow the year that they put together so it's good to get that part out of the way right up front because this game in general there's a lot of different ways you could look at it I think it was a weird game, right? The way it started, yeah. the way it ended. I think the biggest thing you can look at defensively, their inability to stop the passing game. Uh, the, I mean, San Diego State, it just felt like they could get whatever they wanted through the air, and especially when the quarterback broke contain. Uh, and I, I want to get the, Lucas Johnson through four. I have the wrong stats 333. Here. But, and then, yeah. and then 67%, Jesse. 67%, three, three touchdowns. And Jesse yeah. Matthews went crazy as well. They 11 receptions, yeah. How to guard him. And it felt like Jeff Trailer said after the game, like, some of these throws were so good, like, we don't know how we could have defended it any better. And there were times that they were pretty close to guys, and there were other times that the guys were open, and there were, you certainly could have yeah. defended it better. But, Generally, I just think that was very surprising because San Diego State's not known as a passing team. His previous career high was 220 yards. And so to see him come in and do this was was wild, basically. But it could be traced to some of the guys that UTSA had missing if you want to go there. I'm yeah, let's start there. Twenty Up to 25 guys, according to Coach Trailer today, he said it was a mix of academics, flu, COVID, General injuries. General injuries. NFL stuff. NFL stuff. Right. So kind of everything wrapped up there. And there was a significant flu bug that hit the team the last week or so that had some guys down. We don't know who might have been playing through exactly. stuff either. Exactly. Oh, so well. um, you and I noted a few different times that there were some rarely used players yes. getting some significant snaps. Well, any snap in this game is a significant snap. Yeah. But in critical moments of this game, right. not at the end of the game. Like, it was telling when San Diego State went to their – kind of two-minute offense or whatever, and they had to bring extra defensive backs out, like Ryan Chalk and see who was they playing. Just, they didn't have any extra they, defensive like, backs. Like Trey Moore? Yes, Trey thing? Moore was He's in there played, as well. Like, yeah, snaps only in really garbage time for the most part. And he Special was playing, teams, I think. Yeah. Like on second like on second quarter, you know, that kind right, of like. Right, right. And there was one drive on offense where they have Tyke Kellogg was out there. It was Ernesto Almaraz was in it yeah. at guard, and B.J. Daniels was running the ball, and there was one other one. Oh, and... Um, not Gavin Sharp because Gavin Sharp didn't play. Dishman. Dishman. Dan yeah. Dishman was out there as well. Yeah. So just like guys that you don't really lean on in critical situations. Not that not not that any of those guys like haven't played at all. Right. But they just are not usually your go to guys who are on the field that I early think the, 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 the biggest thing I noted was just the offensive personnel. I mean they, they seemed like they were doing a lot of eleven personnel. Yeah, I mean so Leroy Watson was not here. Yeah. He had he had posted to Instagram, I think yeah. it was, that he wasn't gonna be here and and so that changes a lot with your offense really and it's funny because you don't think of Leroy Watson as the biggest threat in terms of the passing game and and that sort of thing but when you're designed to be able to have that power run with just the threat of the passing game and kind of the the way that he allows you to set that up with with Oscar Cardenas being a, kind of the same How many profile. times do you think they've gone two tight end set this year as a, a lot. percentage? 60 yeah. 60%? I, I, that's maybe? not that's not outrageous. Yeah. I mean I guess it's hard cuz you don't know it all ends up being about situations, yes, right? Yes, yeah. But like it, when opponent. when it's the first quarter and they have the option to, yeah, we saw they're going like, twelve tight end. I think Oscar Cardenas yeah. was out there. He didn't get a ton of starts, but there yeah. were games where he was the starter because they went two tight end right. And I game. think that's why we saw so much of Tyke because they were having to use their three wide receivers so much. Yeah. See, when, there were a lot of times during the year. Now that we kind of think about it, where. They got Cephas and Clark and Franklin on the field at the same time, and like yeah. an eleven look because yeah. that's probably your best option. So it's not like they were exclusively two tight end, but it just it takes away that option. And right. who knows if they wanted to play power run against this run defense anyway? Yeah, it was interesting because San Diego State comes in number two in the nation in run defense, seventy six and a half yards per game, I believe it was. Yeah, and UTSA had seventy six in the first quarter. Yeah, but then they kind of got away from it a little bit. 
I think Jeff said there was like a fourth, the fourth and one play where they got stuffed up the middle. They lost a little confidence. Because they just weren't running that much, and it's different when you're behind. It's always easy to look at like, oh, they got away from the run, but you, sometimes you just are behind and you throw the ball. I think we off. crunched the numbers in post game. UTSA had 79 yards of rushing offense in the first quarter, and they looked pretty unstoppable. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly potent. I don't know if unstoppable might be a bit yeah, too much, yeah, but it was. It, they were strong. They were able to move the ball there. Yeah, something like seven point nine yards of rush and ten. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was good. And it, it opens up everything else for the offense if right. you can do that. But then, obviously, I don't even. I don't know if we've even said it yet. Obviously, since here McCormick wasn't playing, right? And so Brendan Brady, you know, had to carry the load, mm-hmm. and BJ Daniels got a few carries and looked good. And I don't think that those guys underperformed at all. I thought I, that, that exactly, they they yeah. did their part of the equation. You know, in the cases where the run game wasn't there, I think it was that maybe just up front some things that didn't didn't hold up. But by the same token, I thought that group played pretty well as well. It was just that they just didn't end up running the ball that often. And maybe that one play where they got stuffed kind of was telling. Or it all comes down to like what they see from the defense and where they think they can exploit them. And obviously, we've talked about all through the year what has made UTSA so much better offensively is that Frank Harris can hit these throws, and you have three potent receivers, and so. You're always playing with your options, and when you have that passing game versus compared to a running game without Sincere McCormick in this run defense, I could see why you would want to lean that way a little bit more. It was just strange that it, the run game worked so well in the beginning. So just to button up the player va- availability issues, it looked like you know they were thin at tight end. Well, yes, I did want to. The whole yeah. reason I got on this was because I wanted to mention the secondary yes. was didn't have Tariq because right. he's out for the NFL. Tariq yeah. won. And then Jamal Sam was not there, yeah. and Rashad was out for the first half. Right. So certainly the you know passing was an issue, and defending the pass was an issue through the whole game. But, yeah. And Rashad played in the second half, but yeah. generally they didn't have all the guys they would usually have out there. And it could be wrong, but it looked like one of the maybe the last touchdown that they scored. That it was Xavier Spencer yeah. in coverage, I right. think. And it's yeah. we don't, he's just not on the field that often yeah. usually. So and they've played without Tariq before, so I don't want to make that like it was the end of the world. But and Jamal Sam missed the first part of the season, but. Just for it to all come together in the toughest game of the year, you know what I mean? Because the you're playing a ranked team in a, in a bowl game, you really would want to have all hands on deck. And I don't know any, uh, the ins and outs of San Diego State, but it certainly seemed like compared to where they had these kind of problems in their conference championship game, and you saw how that worked out, that they were back closer to full strength and that it showed in the way they played. A lot of the fan base seemed disappointed to have so many guys out in probably what a lot of people considered one of the biggest games in you know, program history. UTSA's Did never you? won a bowl. They, they, I mean, it's still a significant feat. But this is not. Isn't this like the fourth biggest game this year or something? It's yeah. It's not even. Come, I, had, maybe I don't six. know. I had a hard time. Like, maybe it was just because of some of the announcements and the guys that we knew weren't playing. And maybe it's just because it had been so long since the conference championship yeah. game. And maybe this is just me and has nothing to do with the team. But I didn't feel the same kind of like energy and excitement towards the game and I don't think that they I mean they just came out and scored on the first drive yeah they had all of the kind of intensity and fire and culture stuff that you would want I, yeah. I think yeah but just the the atmosphere didn't feel like this was like a must-win game that was going to define the season in the same way that so many others this year have mm-hmm. where it's like UTEP felt like everything was on the line and then yeah. UAB felt like everything was on the line and then North Texas you know it was a chance to go 12-0 and and then obviously the conference championship game is the conference championship game, and this game I don't I don't know. Did you feel that kind of vibe today? It just didn't feel like that need was there. Well, I, I think some of the kind of player availability issues was blown out of proportion amongst the fans because a lot of it wasn't optional. I think a lot of people. Kinda, oh sure, right, right. Yeah, a lot of people. Assume, oh yeah, we can, yeah we can talk about the reactions was, to it. Yeah. I don't know if that yeah I don't know yeah. if that was really fair. And I just, I mean. It is. They might have had more players out this bowl game than they had players out last bowl game with COVID and whatnot. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, I, the, I believe it was tw- right. 25. So either way, it's pretty close. So I, that yeah, takes away the, some of the luster to begin with. I mean, yes. We, like to, to your point, we know that Sincere and Tariq are sitting out. I mean, those are the two the are, two big ones, and right? That, that makes, but you understand why right. they're not the first to make that right. decision. Like that's Correct. just kind of how this sort of thing. And works. And they're probably not the wrong decision. Right. I mean, I'll go on the record right now saying both probably made the right decision. How? Yeah, and- it's just like weird because you know Tariq took a risk when he played hurt to come back for the conference championship game. Yeah, he missed the, the four games before that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so what I just don't understand is really like the 
structure of college football in terms of whether these games matter or yeah. not. Yeah. Is it, are we just saying that only the playoff games are important? Because then, like, you know, it's fun to have this narrative of UTSA's never won a bowl game, and that's the next big thing. But if if you if it's you not that best big players, of a, yeah. If it's not that big of a thing, then it's not that big of a thing. You yeah. Know? So that's like a weird kind of conundrum. I think a lot of fans are fall on different parts of that, and that's yeah. why you see different reactions. Yeah. Where to them, this is the biggest game of the year or whatever, and they yeah. really want UTSA to win the first bowl game. But other people say where it's like, yeah, that's how college football works. You sit out, you go pro, and then yeah. that's that's fine. Jeff Trailer said in post game that they had enough players and that it was on him. He didn't get Well, I was going to say that regardless. Yeah, like, he, we got that all yeah, last year. Yeah, right? jump on the grenade a little there. But what, what, you, take, you buy that line this game? I mean, they were thin at a few key spots, and I think it showed – would have had changed the result today. Yeah. Well, so they played, they had a great year, most, a lot of it without Tariq. Yeah. Obviously, since year's been there every step of the way, but we talked about other they The game, production did, wasn't, up. yeah. The, you know, Trevor Harmonson's an interesting one. Yeah. Because he's been, especially last year with the amount of depth that they didn't have, yeah. he was so I think that valuable. was a huge loss today. And I don't, you know, I, you know, on paper, Denzel Feaster is a fine option there, mm-hmm. but with Drew Prox has missed the last few games and then yeah. today as well. So you're back to having really limited depth there where after Ligon and Feaster you're looking at um, Tyler Monkey and Avery Morris, yeah. basically like guys who yeah. don't just don't, don't get on the field yeah. that much and haven't had that experience to this point. So I do think that that was probably a factor there as well, yeah. Um, the other big one, so it's, it was, I, cause I feel like there was, oh, and Dancer. Dancer. Dancer's a big loss yeah. too. Now they all, they have a lot of bodies up there, yeah. Because the defensive line rotation has been a strength, and they feels like they go three deep across the board pretty much. But the more guys you take out, the less well they. Can How many up huge plays has Lorenzo Dancer made this right, season? Right. And, and that this game was there was no fumble that, for him to yeah, recover. But yeah, other than yeah. that, it was it was it was clearly missed. Yeah. I want to talk about a few key plays that I thought maybe this game could have turned. The Frank Harris third quarter interception where it looked like they were at least going to get a field goal maybe out of that yeah so the, i we can break down however many of them that you want but i think the the interesting part for me was that they went they went one of nine on third down and they went one of three on fourth, fourth down, down i think yeah and you know jeff trailer's going to go for it on fourth down and i yep. think it was the right call in both of those situations yep. uh one of you know because you know people trust hunter duplessis and he's been great here but once you start getting into the 50-yard field goal range, that's iffy for anybody, anybody, and it's very iffy for him, too. And we saw last year, I think it became kind of a narrative as the season went on about his leg getting tired. Tired, and yep. I think that's natural and will happen to anybody. And I haven't been paying enough attention to, like, how far the kickoffs are going, yeah. kickoff to kickoff, or if that's a factor this year. But you never know if, you know, and also being outdoors, I don't know how the you know weather kind yeah. of factors in. It wasn't that windy, I don't think, but... Anyway, it's just a harder environment for him to kick a 50-yard field goal, and so that's why when you get in that 30 to 40 range, you, might you tend well. to just go for yeah. it. Because you know what also is a touchdown is worth twice as much as a field goal, yeah. and then the other team doesn't have the ball longer. Exactly. So then there's better, a lot of good, good reasons yeah. to go for it. So the uh, what about that fourth quarter drive to start the the drive to start the fourth quarter where UTSA commits three key penalties, a, a kickoff out of bounds. Right. They were down seven at that point, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and so it's like if you can get a stop, then right. you're, you're in it. You're in it. And that ended up being the game-clinching drive for them. Yeah. I think it was nine plays, 65 yards, and there was well, a yeah, kickoff I mean, out of bounds. How many yards was it really, right? Yeah, the kickoff out of bounds, two unsportsmanlike conduct penalties. Man, and, there were so many penalties in yeah, this game. Very I, chippy game. How long did the <clears> – I wanted to look up how long the game went because it felt like it was a four-hour game. And then I wanted to look up the – penalty numbers but yeah so you had the you had the roughing the passer on Clarence Hicks Clarence Hicks a and Corey Mayfield the Corey Mayfield unnecessary foul. roughness yeah. was I didn't did you see what happened on that I play? did I, I did not and then the drive started with the kick out of bounds and this was after UTSA scored a touchdown to cut it to seven points yeah. and so, it feels like the game's up for grabs as you head to the fourth quarter. Yeah, so UTSA was flagged nine times for 80 yards. Yeah. San Diego State had 14 for 124. And before that drive that you mentioned, it was a San Diego State penalties problem. Yeah, yeah. And then it became a both team yeah. penalties problem yeah. based on what they did there. So, yeah, I, there were any number of plays that I think could have swung it just based on those conversions. Like, it didn't feel like that san diego state was moving the ball mm-hmm. so much better than utsa for the bulk of the game yeah kind of as it went on and then there's like 
There's always these little things that are drive killers, like Frank yeah. slips and it's a yeah. sack, and then that's a punt, and like yeah. that's important, yeah. you know? Like you can't. I think but the receiver do, was open. You can do about yeah. that, but yeah. that's going to happen sometimes. But you only get eight, ten drives in a game or whatever, and if one of them ends that way, that's unfortunate. I want to talk about the season as a whole a little bit, but I want to put a bow on this game particularly. Do you feel like, I mean, San Diego State was ranked ahead of UTSA all season long. Were they just the better team tonight? What a good question. I don't know because, you know, we just, I would have been nice to see UTSA at full strength against them. Yeah, I think that's the question a lot of people are going to have issues or kind of be upset about or feel, have feelings. It's like, okay, you had this 12-2 and two season and you're going up against a team that's been ranked ahead of you all season long and you have something to prove, but... You weren't at full strength. But those guys made plays. Like, San Diego State seemed like a very good team. Yeah. Not a, I didn't – this period has been so hectic. Yeah. Even with the long time building, building up to the ball, I never really got around to, like, studying them and what they're all yeah. about. But, you know, you look at the stats and you see just what they were able to put out there on the field, and it just seems like they're – Legit talented, squad. Legit yeah. group. And so, you know, I thought it was interesting that after the game tra- trailer said – you know, we played a great team and we're going to end the year playing great teams because we are a great team. And yeah. I thought that that was actually kind of a pretty telling way to look at it. Yeah. Like when you when you look at the team that's standing across from you and you see that they're that potent, it reminds you what you had to do to get to that point. Right. And so I think that that's, that's a good a good way to look at it and to pull the positive from the game and the way it played out. Let's talk a little bit about the season as a whole, 12-2, and two, um, conference champions. See, that's what I'm talking about, like, if in three months or whatever, if you think about the season, like the bowl game's going to be pretty far down the list of things that comes to mind, right? Yeah. Conference I, I just, championship. I don't know. It's tough to have the. It's t- it was really tough for me in two hours to try to get the perspective right in the story, but it's it's just doesn't feel like this changes too much about all that they put together. Right, I, and I mean it's just. I think I wrote historic, magical. There's so many words you could use to describe it. I mean various records throughout right they'd won eight games was the best right and now they won 12 yeah and and it's the progression to go four seven twelve you know it's It's a huge leap i don't think you can win 16 next year that seems impossible but you know what i mean like yeah it's a it's an impossible trajectory and so it's it'll be interesting to see we can get into next year later if you want but yeah to to put the season in perspective there's so many moments that are probably going to last in history like how long are people going to be talking about harris to cardenas against uab yeah. you know like these yeah. are things that like they talked about they had that perspective at the time that it's going to go on the wall of the race facility yeah. someday you know what if what if hunter doesn't make that kick in memphis oh we could play what ifs all day yeah. like with western kentucky yeah clarence hicks is right with the gravity defying interception really the chop block that moved yeah. them back from yeah. right off the goal line where yeah. they looked like they were going to punch it in and you know, Illinois was a close game. Yeah. But I do think that in the, you know, Jeff always talks about the, oh, we could have been, like last year he said they could have been 2 and 10 or they could have been 10 and 2 or yeah. something like that. I felt like this year they were the better team more often that they went out on the field. They hit like an apex towards the middle of the yeah, season right. where they were kind of on a roll. But even like, it felt like they were better than Illinois. Yeah. I don't know if it felt like they were better than Memphis. That felt pretty yeah. even. Yeah. But, in, it just and especially like you mentioned, like UTEP was not it wasn't a contest. Yeah. UAB that felt pretty even. Western Kentucky felt pretty even. But like there were enough games where they were just better than the team that they played. Even a game like Southern Miss that ended up being close, they were clearly the better team. And UNLV that ended up being close, they were clearly the better team. I thought like it's not like that game was actually a coin flip, even though it kind of came down to the last drive. So yeah. I think that compared to last season where it really did feel like a lot of these games could have gone any number of ways. This year, they still had their share of close wins, but there were a lot of really decisive outcomes in there, too. Like, Louisiana Tech was never in doubt, for example. Rice was never in doubt. And then there were close games where they were better than the other team, and it just kind of happened to be close. But I think that, like, what they did seems legit. Like, it... I don't know if they're a 12-win team on paper, but they're a 10, yeah. 10 or 11-win team on paper this year, which, again, plays into... We talked about the schedule quite a bit, which is they played one of the weaker schedules yeah. out there. But to still be able to just decisively beat teams on a week-to-week basis is something not a lot of programs can do. Really, regardless of the level of competition, you'll have some letdowns 
Mm-hmm. You'll have cases where your culture doesn't show up, but they yeah. didn't run into that really. North Texas, you can you can Almost, frame it that yeah, way if you yeah. want, but then there was the, the weather, weather, yeah. and the whole deal. So, yeah, I think that they they deserved the season that they had. Let me wrap this up by asking you the question I asked Jeff Trailer, and he didn't want to reflect on it because he was moments after the game. And did are are, are, are GTSA fans going to look back at this season as kind of the turning point of the program? You know, trying to become a consistent winner trying to compete i kind of feel like last year was more of the turning point right just to go from losing i don't want to say losing culture that sounds really bad but like where that's kind of expected and you're hoping that you're going to get to six to six six and six that year to where now the expectation is something different and that started with with going seven and four and i don't know if you could pinpoint a moment in yeah. there I feel like maybe when they beat Louisiana Tech or something, that yeah. felt really significant in that 2020 season. But you, that to me is where the trajectory kind of changed. Because if you think of, if you think of this as a turning point, that implies that there's somewhere upper to go from here. And yeah. I think that's asking that's a lot. A hard, yeah. To just repeat this would be yeah. incredible. And yeah. then again, we've talked about next season, um, <clears throat> Houston Army in Texas right yeah. out the gate. Yeah. So it, it all took the war you, daddies. Yeah. It took you uh, 14 games to lose two, and yeah. it might take you two games to lose two. two. Yeah. And that wouldn't even be, like, frowned upon. That'd yeah. be fine. Yeah. That's just, like, sometimes you... And so to say that there's any kind of expectation in line with what they accomplished this year is tough. And I said that last year, though. Yeah. When they went 7-5, and five, I was like, I don't know if they can go 7-5 and five again. That's going to be hard. And then yeah. they just blew it out of the water. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would gladly be proven wrong again yeah. if they could, sub- if they could do the yeah. same, if they could repeat this. But... It's an uphill battle, and it's just tough for any team to sustain that level. And that's not even to mention that the conference shift that's coming up and things right. like that, and like recruiting and all that. And well, I had six and six. I think you had seven and a half. I had some <clears throat> stupid. Yeah, seven, yeah. seven, eight, and eight and five with the bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just they just blew it out of the water. Which is, I mean, it's not even that. Just the national ranking, everything, all, all the records, the. Jeff Trailer contract extension. Yeah, just, the conference move is the in conference there too, move. We about just and, like I mean, you wrote about it last week. Just all the magical things that have happened this season. So many of those top moments. Yeah, the in top program, ten moments in program history. They a were lot this of them year. Happened this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So what a what a magical. And the season. conference championship is you know, it's just been funny. Or funny is the wrong word. It's just been really enlightening to hear them talk about how many firsts they've checked off and how you know this was the last one on the list. And they didn't get it, but it just, I get we to sort of circle back to that. It just feels like it's not as important as the other yeah. ones. Like, yeah. if, if they had lost the conference championship and won the bowl game, yeah. I don't think that that would have had exactly. the same kind of, like, they. I think they hit the important marks. The UAB <laughs> was huge, and the conference championship was huge, and the national ranking was huge while they had it. And this would have been, I mean, fittingly, I don't think he meant it this way, but Brendan Brady said it was going to be the cherry on top if they won. Yeah. And I liked that quote and used it in my story because that's, like, what that's it is. What they it didn't is. need it. Yeah. But yeah. it would have been nice, but they didn't need it. It's still The year is still the year that they had. So it's early Wednesday morning here in Frisco. You've and As I've, far as I'm concerned, it's Saturday. We've and been here since football game Friday. On a Tuesday thing has really thrown me off. Yeah, it's been a heck of a week with a lot of... Uh, Change of pace from last year where bowl week was a day and a half or something. So. Yeah, and it was cool. I think they got to do a lot of interesting stuff The if you guys haven't watched the clip that UTSA football posted of the Family Feud style yeah. game show, I enjoyed that one. That turned into a I wanted dance to off. See, I wanted to see a full hour of that or however yeah. long it went, yeah. but I'll take the two minute clip that they gave me. The cowboy hats were a hit. Yes, can we shout out? I want to mention Frank Harris yeah. wore his cowboy hat yeah. in the post game. After the loss. After the yeah. loss. It's really easy to wear a cowboy hat when everything's going well, yeah. but when you show up to the post game press conference after a loss wearing the cowboy hat, yeah. that's. Respect. I respect that yeah. a lot. Yeah. You can't just do you can't just do these things when it's bright and sunny. Well, that'll wrap it up, Greg. What a wild 2021 season it's been. Any, when are it, we going to come to the it, people next? Is any next final fall? thoughts? Any final thoughts here? Do we, is it? Are we going to hear from? Are they going to hear from us before next fall? Spring maybe. Do we, oh yeah, of course there's spring football. Yeah, duh. Yeah, got some quarterback quarterback uh, competition maybe. You can stir that up. I want, I thought I was the one who was going to stir that up. <laughs> who knows? Uh, that is a transfer portal. Can of worms. Yeah. Transfer portal guys. I mean, you got to replace since you're right? Yeah. Who knows? Well, yeah, it can so. happen. Um, signing day in February. They they still got a handful of dudes to sign, and it's going to be interesting to see how that 
recruiting class shakes out. It was interesting already that they got that running back in here. Yeah, yeah that they signed like a big. big time Juke running back. They announced it yesterday. All these days. That so funny how sincere mesh. leaves and then that comes together. Yeah, so wow. Fast. What a, what Who would have thought? Well, that'll wrap it up, Greg. Hey, I really appreciate you doing this all year. It seems like. I, listen, I'm grateful for the exposure. It, people, pe people, people come up to me and they don't say, hey, you're the guy who writes the stories. <laughs> they say, hey, you're the guy in the videos with yeah, JJ. So yeah. I, I need the exposure. It's been a so lot of fun. That. We do appreciate everybody watching. The the views this season have gone through the, through the roof. So that'll wrap it up. JJ Perez, Inside Runner Sports, Greg Lucas, Antonio Express News. Until next time, we'll thanks see for you watching. guys. Thanks.